Proverbs 5, 14 to 23. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. This is the person who now has, has fallen into sexual sin. And then the command, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. And now he's warning against adultery. You know, so you've made a vow now. He's talking about to someone who's married. Um, so uh, figuratively speaking, drink water from your own cistern. Only have sex with your spouse. Uh, running water from your own well, not from other people. Should your springs overflow into the streets, your streams of water into the public squares, should you be promiscuous, um, not uh, single-minded in, in, in purity? No. Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. God intended the sexual relationship for man and woman in a marriage. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, that was a compliment back then. Um, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. So one of the first things you see about this passage and other passages of Scripture, notably Song of Solomon, is this is not about being prudish. This is about realizing that sex is a gift of God intended to be experienced within the bounds of this relationship and enjoy it, and it should be enjoyed. To be intoxicated by sexual pleasure with your spouse, there is no negativity about sex in this passage. And it's really important that we recognize that. Because so often it's like people perceive that Christians are the ones who are down on sex. No, we're down on immorality, but we feel great about sex, or we should. Who created sex? I mean, if you think sex is the product of the time plus chance plus evolutionary forces, and you're a you know you believe you embrace a worldview of naturalism, you might be fairly neutral towards sex, or you might think the only good thing about sex is that it propagates the species, and the highest value is that the human race uh, should continue. But you really can't make a value judgment about whether it's good or bad, because you don't even have a foundation for goodness and badness. Yeah, you know uh, pleasure and lack of pleasure, but you don't know. But for us as believers, God made it. And if we're ever talking or thinking as if Satan invented sex, something is very wrong. God invented sex. And an analogy would be, and I use this a lot, and I would recommend this when you're talking with people, is uh, take fire. Fire is a gift of God. What would we do without fire in its different forms that we cook with it? Um, actually, um, when you heat things through electricity, the, the principles uh, or, you know, gas or um, propane or, or whatever it is, the principles related to combustion, this is the source of heat. What would we do without fire for cooking, for uh, warming ourselves, for the other things that fire is good for? Great, powerful gift of God. What would we do without water? I mean, is water a bad thing? Oh no, it's a wonderful thing. It's essential to life. Now think of fire out of control. Have you ever seen fire out of control? You've at least seen it on television. Any of you been close to an actual out of control fire? Okay. Uh, it's scary, isn't it? It's devastating. Uh, what about water? You ever been near a flood, tsunami? Flood? Yeah. 93, I grew up in St. Louis, um, the Missouri and Mississippi River was both flooded. Um, yeah. And it, my entire hometown of St. Charles was almost flooded. Wow. Yeah. And what about the fire? Was fire was in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, uh, grasslands along yeah. the highway. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, when, when I've seen, uh, I've, I've not been in the midst of a forest fire, but in Oregon we have so many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of timber and to drive through where there's been a burn and to see these beautiful trees that are smoldering now. And then we live very near Mount St. Helens and when, when uh, it erupted, uh, for days we're wearing masks and and all I mean the power and the devastation the numbers of some people killed and the n numbers of animals wildlife killed utter devastation uh, one time we were going on vacation to Hawaii our friends had a house over there and they said you want to stay here oh yeah great you know so we drive in we get there we haven't unpacked yet get a call on myself from my friend he's, and he said have you heard about the tsunami you know no, tell me about the tsunamis. We'll turn on the TV. I would think that the warning sirens will go off any time because it was the big one in Japan and it's headed toward Hawaii and it's going to be big and uh, you'll have to evacuate and I'm sure they won't let you you know, stay there. Um, not that we would want. So we evacuate and we drive up a hill and all this kind of stuff. And, and we come back and we see it wasn't nothing like the devastation that even they expected and certainly nothing compared to what it was in Japan. But it's like, wow, so this great thing that we could not live without. And I love to go out snorkeling and it's gorgeous and it's this wonderful gift of God but out of control, it's devastating. Fire, out of control, it's devastating. Exactly the same way, by analogy, with sex. The better and more powerful and more beautiful and more wonderful a thing is, the worse it is when it is taken out of its God-given context, the intended place, the boundaries that God intends for.